Hello! Firstly, this video is late and I apologise. I usually post on a Monday and I did plan on posting this video on Monday but I went for a skiing lesson, my first ever skiing lesson, and I kind of skied right into a tree which was kind of painful and I was kind of sore so I didn't want to film yesterday and um, I'm still kind of sore but I'm okay for filming today. So here I am. This is my March reading wrap up and I read a lot of books, a lot of books in March. It was a really great reading month for me. I don't quite know how I managed to finish as many books as I did but I read 12 books in the month of March and I actually finished a book on the 1st of April which I am also going to include in this video even though I didn't finish it in March purely because the rest of April is going to be taken up with books that I'm reading for the Owls readathon so I just wanted to wrap that one up here as well since I've already finished it. I was hoping to finish it in March but that didn't quite manage to happen which is fine because like I said I already read 12 books in March which is crazy. So I would recommend that you grab a drink, maybe a cup of tea, hot chocolate, coffee, whatever takes your fancy because this is going to be a long one and I'm going to get into it. So the first book that I finished in March was The Bitter Kingdom by Ray Carson which is the last book in the Fire and Thorns trilogy. I read the first two books in the month of February so I will link my wrap up for that up there for you. This is the concluding novel to the trilogy so I can't really tell you what this one is about but the trilogy in general follows a girl named Alyssa who is a princess of one kingdom who enters into an arranged marriage with the king of a neighbouring kingdom for political reasons and she has never been in a relationship before so she is navigating that. She's navigating moving away from home to a different land and she's also navigating the theology that surrounds her because she is the bearer of the Godstone and the Godstone is a religious item which resides in her belly button and prophecies say that she is bound for greatness but she doesn't know what that greatness involves, she doesn't know what is going to happen to her, all she knows is that previous bearers have all died young. And that's all I'm going to tell you about the trilogy in general. In terms of this final book I did really enjoy it. It's definitely more along the normal plot lines that you see in more epic fantasy so this one was much more adventure and action filled than the previous two novels which did focus more on political manoeuvring and the setup of the world and the characters of course because they were the opening novels. So we didn't need to do any introductions or anything in this one but there was character development which was nice and I really enjoyed this concluding novel and I enjoyed the way the series ended. I can be very very picky with my endings and I did enjoy this one and I gave it four out of five stars. Then I picked up Flying Witch by Chihiro Ishizuka. This is just a quick um, manga which is aimed at children following a girl named Makoto who is a witch and has moved into her cousin's house to complete her witch training and she brings with her her little black hat familiar which is very cute and it's very episodic each um, sort of chapter in this volume one of the manga is its own very quick short story we're not really getting into much of the witch training just yet it's mostly just introducing us to the characters and the setting for the story but it is very cute and it was a nice quick read that I gave three out of five stars. Then I finished reading The Well of Ascension by Brandon Sanderson which I listened to on audiobook. This is the second book in the first era Mistborn trilogy and it is a reread for me. I really enjoyed the audiobook experience, it was really great. Michael Kramer is a fantastic narrator and I can struggle sometimes with narrators with American accents but his is really easy 
easy to follow. I've managed to amp up the speed on my audiobooks a little bit now, which is great because I do sometimes struggle to completely absorb what's being narrated if it's too slow, but also while I was getting used to audiobooks, having the speed too high was difficult as well. So I'm glad that I'm able to amp it up to a more reading style speed for me. And the thing that I like about Michael Kramer in particular is that he gives each of the characters their own distinctive voice but without putting on voices. That might not make a lot of sense, the only thing I could suggest is maybe listen to a sample of his narration but I am really impressed by him. In terms of the story, once again it's a sequel so I can't necessarily tell you what that one is about but the first book, The Final Empire, follows a group of Scar thieves. Scar are the downtrodden part of the population, what you would normally refer to as serfs in fantasy, and they are very much oppressed by the nobility and particularly the Lord Ruler, who is an immortal who took over a thousand years ago and has been ruling with an iron fist ever since. And the band of thieves that we follow want to overthrow the Lord Ruler and free the Scar population. We also have a super interesting magic system in this series which is based around the consumption and burning of metals. Two types of magical being in this world, one is called Mistings which can burn one kind of metal to gain one kind of ability and then there are Mist born who are very rare and those who are mistborn are able to consume and burn all metals. Book two, The Well of Ascension, focuses a lot more on the aftermath of book one and the politics that surround that. Many people complain that the plot of book two is a lot slower and it is. It's definitely more focused on world building and character development than actual plot or action but there's still an awful lot that happens in this book and it's all very very important and having read book three I also know that everything that happens in book two is vitally important to book three. I personally love book two, it's still a five star read for me, but if you haven't read the series before just bear in mind that book two most people do find a little bit slower. Then I picked up The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison, and I actually read this one for a book group that I have joined in central London. This one is also epic fantasy but it is very heavy. I found this one very very heavy. It follows three main protagonists and one of those protagonists is told in second person so you did this, you did that which was a little odd at first and I expected to have trouble with but actually it didn't take me very long to get into that style of writing and I found myself quite enjoying it so it, it didn't bother me too much but it's something to be aware of if you're considering picking this one up because I know it won't be for everyone. I also hate to have to mention this but the diversity in this book is fantastic and the reason I hate to mention it is because I don't feel like it should have to be a thing that is praised. It should just be a norm but unfortunately it's not. This book is very diverse. We have the main cast of characters are all people of colour, there's also lots of different religions, lots of social classes, lots of sexualities represented here, belief systems, all that kind of thing. It's very diverse overall but in particular it's very racially diverse and culturally diverse which is great but again sad that that even has to be a thing that I point out. One thing that I do also need to point out is that this book is chock full of triggers, chock full of them. So I'm going to give a as full a list of trigger warnings as possible now which potentially could be spoilery. So if you don't have a problem with any triggers at all and you don't want to be potentially spoiled for some of the plot elements in this book then maybe skip ahead 30 seconds or so but I think that because of how heavy the triggers are in this book it is really important that I tell you what those trigger warnings are in case there's something you need to be aware of. So I'm going to try and give as comprehensive a list as possible but if you don't want to know anything then skip ahead just know that there's trigger warnings for basically everything. So we have triggers for child abuse including sexual abuse, child death, sexual abuse of adults, sexual exploitation, rape of both adults and children, physical abuse, verbal abuse, slavery, natural disasters, 
and depression. So I've probably forgotten some as well because this book is very, very dark. There are lots of triggers in here so please be aware of that if you're thinking about picking this one up because it's dark. It's a really dark read and also it's really heavy going on the world building, really heavy going. The author has a very descriptive narrative style that goes along with her world building which usually isn't my preference. Now it's not quite as detailed as the likes of Tolkien but it's more detailed held than say Brandon Sanderson's world building. It's, it's quite in depth and it can make the beginning of the book quite slow and heavy going. If you're not usually a fantasy or epic fantasy reader then I would not recommend starting here because it's heavy. It's very heavy going. There's also a magic system which doesn't get explained until quite a bit later on in the book properly so I don't really want to tell you about that here either because again it's potentially spoilers but it just bear in mind that it is quite heavy going. In terms of the plot we follow the three protagonists, they're all women, and we follow their circumstances and their journey through this land. So we have Demaya, our youngest protagonist, who travels to the capital to learn her craft. Cyanite, who is a teenager and she is sent on a mission. And Esun, who is the character that is told through second person perspective. She is a middle-aged woman with a family and following the death of her son goes to search for her daughter who's been kidnapped. Um, that's not a spoiler, that all happens in the first couple of pages so don't worry. But their stories are all very interesting, the ending was very satisfying, there is plenty to continue with in the rest of the trilogy but it's not so open as to be a cliffhanger or to be annoying in any way. I did enjoy this book but I did find it very heavy and that's coming from somebody who reads epic fantasy all the time so again bear that and the heavy trigger warnings in mind if you do decide to pick this one up. I gave it four out of five stars and I am hoping to pick up the sequel very soon. Next I'm going to talk about Caraval and Legendary by Stephanie Garber. I didn't read them one after the other but I did read them both in the month of March so I'm going to talk about them together since they're in the same trilogy. I did also read Caraval in a vlog so I will link that vlog up there for you in case you're interested. These books I did also enjoy and I did get through them very quickly. They are written in a very easy to read narrative style and they each follow a different protagonist. So in this book, this is book one, so it's the book that I'm predominantly going to talk about in terms of plot, we follow Scarlet who is engaged to be married to a count from the mainland. She lives on one of the islands but she's never met him, she only knows him through letters that he sent to her but she has also always dreamed of going to Caraval. Caraval being sort of like a carnival but with magic and it happens once a year and it's invitation only, but Scarlet is not allowed to leave the island that she lives on and so she is constantly writing to Legend, the Caraval Master, to ask him to bring the Caraval to her island. She finally gets an opportunity to go and it follows her journey through the Caraval, which is sort of like a fantasy mystery, which I quite enjoyed. Legendary has a similar plot line, but I don't want to tell you too much about it because of course there could be spoilers, well there would be spoilers for book one in the synopsis of book two, so I'm not going to tell you about that, but I will tell you that we follow a different protagonist in book two than we do to book one. Now, I didn't feel immediately connected to Scarlet in Caraval. I felt more of a connection to the protagonist in book two more quickly than I felt to the protagonist in book one. So that was a little bit heavy going for me in the first place. I felt like the characters in Caraval in particular were a little bit one note and were too extreme in that one characteristic. It wasn't until later in the book that they became a little bit more multifaceted which makes them a bit more realistic and likeable for me but I still did enjoy the plot which was very intriguing and that is definitely what kept me engaged. Even though I am usually more of a character driven reader the plot was good enough in this one 
one to keep me engaged and I did enjoy both of these books. Like I said they were really quick reads for me because of the narrative style which I enjoyed. Because of the slow start to Caraval and the time it took me to get invested in the characters and what was happening to them I gave this one three stars whereas Legendary I gave four stars because I connected with the characters much more quickly. Because I'd already been introduced to them in Caraval as well but also because they were just engaging from the very start in Legendary. Also worth mentioning the last book in the trilogy is called Finale and it is coming out in May and I have ordered the fairy loot box that will contain that book so I will be reading it in May hopefully. Then there were a couple of books again that I didn't necessarily read one after the other but I am going to talk about them together because they're part of the same series again and that is Made Sama by Hiro Fujiwara. This is a bind up of volume one and two and I did read both volumes in the month of March. This follows a girl named Mizaki who is the student council president at a school that historically has been an all boys school but has started accepting female students and Unfortunately, the boys had turned the school into a little bit of a mess. They don't dress properly, they play silly games, and Misaki wants to turn all of that around and make the school somewhere that the students can be proud to attend and make it a bit more comfortable for the girls. But she also has a secret in that in her spare time, she works at a maid cafe to support her family because her mum is ill. And when one of the other high achieving and popular boys from school discovers that she is a maid, she is terrified that he will tell the rest of the school population and her reputation as student president will be ruined. I find this series incredibly cute. The male protagonist who we don't we don't have anything from his perspective it's all told from the perspective of Misaki but he clearly likes Misaki quite a lot and she thinks that he's just making fun of her and the chemistry between them is fantastic and I honestly can't wait for them to get together. It's quite obvious that they will end up together at some point and I'm really enjoying that. I think it's really really fun. It's a nice light fluffy read in between some of the heavier books that I've read this month and so I really enjoyed it for that. I gave both volumes one and two three stars. The next book that I completed was Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett and again this is epic fantasy and it was absolutely fantastic. I 100% loved 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 this book and I could gush about it for hours. It is a fantastic fantastic first book in a trilogy and a fantastic book in its own right. I haven't ever read anything by Robert Jackson Bennett before but he's definitely now on my radar and I am keen to pick up his other trilogy which is the City of Stars, City of Blades and City of Miracles. I'm not sure what the name of the trilogy is but I'm definitely interested to pick it up because I really enjoyed the narrative style in this. There is a lot of world building and magic system building but as in most epic fantasy a lot of the magic system building is what takes up the intrigue of the plot which is something that I always really enjoy and the world building was delivered in a very non-heavy way. In a lot of ways it's the complete opposite of the fifth season in that way because the world building in this one is dealt with a lot more naturally and also it has the benefit of not having such a large world to build as in the fifth season. The whole of this book takes place in a city which is is broken up into various houses, kind of a little bit like the Mafia I would think, and then the in-between places are the slums as it were. And we follow a thief from the slums named Sanchia. What makes her such a good thief is the fact that she can touch objects and hear their pasts. Which in particular makes her very good at climbing walls because if she touched the wall with her bare hand then she knows exactly where all the handholds are for example. The magic system in this book is also really really interesting and it is called scriving and how scriving works is if you write 
on an object in a specific language, you can make it believe something different about itself so that it will behave differently. So for example, if you scribed a piece of wood into believing it was actually a piece of cement, it would have the same level of strength as its cement rather than as wood. And it would therefore be able to hold up a heavy building when otherwise it may not have been able to do so. Which is a very, very interesting magic system. And the thing that I find quite rewarding about magic systems like this is that nobody can just be instantly good and naturally good at magic. It takes a lot of time and study and dedication to understand the magic system and so you have to work at it and I really appreciate that in epic fantasy because unfortunately sometimes you can find that people are just naturally good at magic immediately and that's not particularly realistic, which I know is an odd complaint to have about a fantasy book, but there you go. There are also just some incredible characters in this book and they're introduced slowly, but I, I liked all of them from the minute that they were introduced and as they all slowly converged and came together, it was just so entrancing and I absolutely loved the relationships between the characters that developed. This book was incredible and if you're not an epic fantasy reader, typically, but you want to be, I would say that this is a really great place to start. Even those of us who read a lot of it, it's a super, super enjoyable book with a very interesting world and a very intricate and interesting magic system. I gave this book five stars. Then I reread The Alchemist, The Secrets of the Immortal Nicholas Flamel by Michael Scott and I also listened to this one on audiobook. This is a middle grade book which follows two teenagers who are twins, Sophie and Josh, as they stumble upon the magical world of Nicholas Flamel. And this book brings together a lot of of myths and legends which is really interesting. So of course we've got Nicholas Flamel but we also have the Morrigan which is the crow goddess, Hecate which is the three-faced goddess, so things like that. I'm not going to give away too much more than that but just know that this combines together a lot of different mythologies and legends, mostly European based ones though. That I, I haven't noticed any you know eastern inspired mythologies in this at all yet although I haven't finished the series which is why I'm rereading it because when I originally read the series it wasn't all out yet so I wanted to pick it back up again, reread the books that I have already read which is just books one, two and three and then read books four and five I think to finish it off but it is a super fun read, it's just something very light and easy to follow. It's set, it's, it's urban fantasy really so it's set in our world so there's not a lot of world building involved although there is some. The magic system is a very soft magic system, there aren't really any rules to it, it's pretty much just if you can access magic you can do whatever you want. The only real rule is that it's strength based so it does use energy. Um, other than that not many rules at least not in this first book and not that I can remember in books two or three either but the characters are engaging enough. Nicholas Flamel is always an interesting character in any book that he appears in I think and so it was an enjoyable read. Nothing groundbreaking but again a nice low level fantasy to mix in amongst all of the heavier reads that I read. <laughs> I gave this one three stars. Then because I was quite enjoying the middle road thing I picked up The Wizards of Once by Cressida Cowell which is also a middle grade book and this one follows two main characters. So we have Zar, who is a wizard and Wish who is a warrior princess. And the wizards and the warriors are warring clans but when Wish and Zar stumble across each other they discover that there might just be an evil out there that they need to combine forces to defeat. This book is full of illustrations which made it a really fun and a really quick read for me and I finished it in just over 24 hours including it being a work day. So it is a very quick and easy 
read. It is the first book in a series. I'm not sure whether that is going to be a trilogy or more books than three, but it was really enjoyable. There's not a huge amount of world building or magic system building. Again, we have a very soft magic system here with a forest based world that is similar enough to our own world that it's easy to catch on what's going on. The thing that I enjoyed the most about this book was the way that it was written. The plot was fast paced and intriguing but it also managed to deal with some sensitive themes such as death in a way that would be accessible for the age group that it is directed to. I feel like it's really important that authors not shy away from those kinds of topics in children's literature because unfortunately they're facts of life and they're things that we'll all have to deal with at some point and I think preparing children for those things is never a bad thing and also there can be this tendency towards thinking that children can't cope with that kind of content and middle grade literature is aimed at ages 8 to 12 I believe so I think by that age they can cope with the kinds of themes that were dealt with within this book and also the narrative style was great because there was enough challenging language in this that would enable somebody in that age group to develop their vocabulary while not being dumbed down so as to almost patronise the reader and the other good thing about that is that it makes it accessible for older readers such as myself as well. So this was a book that I thoroughly enjoyed and I look forward to book two coming out. I think it's out already but I'm going to wait for it to come out in paperback format later in the year. I think the paperback is out in May and I will definitely be picking up that sequel and giving it a read because this was a really really enjoyable quick read in between again some of the heavier things that I do pick up. I gave this one four out of five stars. Then I read To Best the Boys by Mary Weber which was the fairy loot book this month and I decided to pick this one up straight away because the premise of the book sounded really interesting. However, I do not agree with the synopsis on this book whatsoever. The synopsis tells you that this book follows a girl who disguises herself as a boy to enter a male-only competition to win a scholarship at a male-only university and the competition is based in a labyrinth. And all of those things do happen but that isn't the main part of the story, that's not what this book is about, that is a part of a larger story. So I, I don't agree with the synopsis for this one at all and I think it's probably a case of publishers just detailing the fun part of the plot in the synopsis to sell more copies but I don't agree that that's what this book is about. What this book is actually about, having read it, is a girl who wants to be a scientist in a society that is geared towards women being wives and she wants to fight against that, particularly because her mother is suffering from a currently incurable disease and she is desperate to find a cure for that disease. And this is about our female character navigating this world that is set up for her not to be able to achieve her dreams, but she doesn't want to hear that and she wants to fight against it. And actually, I'm really not sure why the synopsis doesn't reflect that, because I think that's a really powerful narrative and it's something that is so prevalent. This story chooses to tackle that issue through the lens of female empowerment but it's applicable across the board to so many people in all walks of life and so I'm really quite surprised that the publisher didn't decide to capitalise on that in terms of the synopsis. The labyrinth competition is fun but it's only an element of the plot and it's not even the main element of the plot in my opinion. I did still really enjoy this book but my enjoyment of the book was definitely hampered by the fact that it's not about what the synopsis says that it's about and had I known the synopsis that I just gave you before reading this I think I probably would have enjoyed it more because I would have gone into it not expecting a labyrinth competition as the main part of the plot because that doesn't happen until quite late on in the book and when you're expecting that to be the main part of the plot it makes it feel a lot more slow than actually it is. It didn't need to feel slow while I was reading it but it did because I was waiting for that 
element of the plot to happen and it didn't happen for quite a while because it's actually not the main point of the plot. So unfortunately I only gave this book three stars which is still a good rating because it is still a good book but I think that it would have been a four or a five star if the synopsis that was written on the cover had been a bit more accurate and so I'm hoping that anybody who's watching this if you're interested in picking this one up I still think you should but go into it knowing that the synopsis that's written on the cover isn't really what this book is about and it's about so much more than just a competition where a girl disguises herself as a boy. That's part of it but it's so much more than that. And finally we come to the book that I actually finished in April although I did read the majority of it in March and that is Viper by Bex Hogan and this was the other book in the March Fairy Loot box and again the premise sounded so interesting that I was desperate to pick it up straight away and so I did and the synopsis for this one is a lot more accurate um, and I really really enjoyed this book. This is a sea based fantasy story which isn't something that I read a lot of so it was interesting to have that different world and also it means that there doesn't need to be so much world building at least not at the beginning because the the ocean is the ocean, there's only so much you can say about a ship and the sea. Uh, there are land-based parts of the plot but by that point we were grounded enough with the characters that it meant that that world building really wasn't onerous at all. Our main character Marianne is super engaging and I felt connected to her almost immediately. She is the daughter of the ship's captain and the ship's captain is referred to as the Viper and he works for the king patrolling the seas and is meant to keep the peace but really he's a bit more of a classic pirate type character which was interesting and Marianne isn't quite cutthroat enough for her father the viper. She is much more of a tender healing type of soul and we follow her struggles trying to come to terms with who she is and what that means for her future because she should take over from the viper one day but she feels like she's a very very different person to him and th this is definitely one of those books that is character based and that's something that I love. I loved Marianne and I really enjoyed following her story no matter where it took her. It was a pretty fast paced plot and a lot happened but I, I didn't get bored at any point and I definitely would have finished it at the weekend if my plans on Sunday hadn't taken me a lot longer than anticipated. I definitely would have finished this in March so it didn't take me longer because it's a heavy book at all. It just took me longer because I ran out of time because of other things that I had planned. This was really really a great book with great characters. There were consequences which I always like to mention. A lot of these books have consequences but the reason I bring it up in relation to this read is because it read like the kind of book that there wouldn't be consequences but there were and that's something that I really appreciate because sometimes in young adult literature those consequences can be skirted over and I think that it's important and it adds to the realism of a story if there are real life consequences to people's actions and there definitely were which is something that I personally enjoyed and made me even more connected and even more on the edge of my seat throughout this read. I gave this book four out of five stars. And that is it for all of the books that I read in March plus one that I finished in April. This was a long one so <laughs> if you're still here thank you so much for watching. If you like this video and want to see more like this from me then do think about hitting that subscribe button and I hope to see you here again soon. Thanks, bye.